For three years, Katie Blomquist has been giving away bicycles to needy kids in Charleston. Today, I sit down one-on-one -on -one with the founder of Going Places for this edition of Quintense Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and download my free Quintense Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Katie Blomquist, welcome to Quintense Close Ups. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it greatly. Obviously, you are the founder of Going Places, which really helps a lot of kids get bicycles each year. Yep. What does Going Places mean to you these days? Um, it pretty much means to me what it's always meant to me. It's, it's the, the basis behind it is that every child deserves joy. And we forget that joy is a piece of our social emotional health. And it is something that is just as important as the typical needs that we think of when we think of charities like food, clothing, shelter, water. Joy really, whether we've had it or not as a child, can really affect what type of adult we become. And so I think, you know, people take for granted those memories of joy that we all share in as society. And those are the basic things. It's not the big, the newest video game. It's the most basic things like riding a bike, dressing up for Halloween, the things that kind of are a, a staple to our childhood. Childhood. Where do you get your joy from these days? Well, from my job, really. I mean, I, I work a lot, um, more than I think uh, the average person. But... I'm excited. To, I don't get the Sunday scaries anymore. I I love work days because everything I'm doing and every meeting I go on is because someone's excited to help me spread joy to these kids. And so I always have that bike reveal date in mind, just knowing every meeting and everything I'm doing is one step closer to be able to provide these kids to, to change their childhood. So that is a huge, huge piece of joy in my life. Joy in your life. What have you replaced the Sunday scaries with? Uh, um, the financial scaries, <laughs> oh. <laughs> just you know, it's all it's stressful. It's, it's a, a one man show, you know. And yeah. of course, I have a wonderful board and supporters yes. and volunteers. Right. But at the end of the day, it's me that's responsible for raising, you know, sixty plus thousand dollars, you know, on average. And so um, that's definitely will keep me up at night, at night. Uh, often. Um, but you know, it's, if I don't do it, no one's going to. And so I just have to work really, really hard every day and get as many people on board as possible that want to help us. You know, plan, right now we're planning our first gala. Oh, yeah. And so that's going to be a great way to fundraise and spread awareness of what we're doing. But I have to make sure I plan it and I surround myself with people who can help me plan it so it's the best it could be to raise the funds that we need. What you're doing right now. If you were to stand in front of the board and many of the staff members and your supporters and donors, what would be the state of going places address right now? What do you mean? The state of going places. The where are you at right now? Where are we at right now? As an organization. Financially, projects, um, etc. I mean, every year it's become more and more. Like every year we seem to take, you know, two steps forward. So we're um, we're at to, we're at right now funding two schools per year. We have the possibility of funding a third locally, possibly in the fall, depending how well the gala goes. And our goal is to expand uh, nationally this year. So we have the potential to expand to two other big cities in the fall. So that's a huge you know jump from where we were last year. We just added two new board members who are heavily focused on. One of them is an internal marketing team, and one of them is um, a financial guy who's heavily laser focused on getting us those big funds that we need. You know, getting that twenty-five thousand dollar check written from individuals and companies. So um, we have these. We're we're. I get excited to think every year. Gosh, where will we be next year at this? You know, at this time, and in the next year's time, because every year it's that much further. That much further. What is the theme going places in twenty twenty? Um, it to expand. Um, my our biggest goal is to expand nationally and to be able to add another school into our instead of doing two schools here, doing three schools here. And you know, we raised over seventy to seven thousand dollars just in November and December of last year. Right. So if we could do that in two months, now with all these extra people helping and you know being able to have our gala, just think what we can do next you know, this year. This year, why the gala? Why now? Well. This is where we're entering our third year, and I found it was, you know, we weren't ready to put on a big event like that before. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, it's a one-man show. Sure. It's just me, and so everyone else is volunteers. Sure. And I've been still learning 
how to run the nonprofit. You know, I mean, there's certain things I've been naturally good at, but there's other things I don't, I'm not going to pretend like I know. And so it's been important that I've been continuing to learn every aspect of how to run a nonprofit appropriately. And so we were focused on just, and I had to really focus on getting those sponsors, getting the awareness. No one knew, if no one knows who you are, who's going to come to your gala? So I had to spend all my time on all of that. Whereas I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever planned a gala or a wedding, but it's in, they're very much the same. I work at five church. We do weddings all the time. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's um, extremely time consuming. And so we, in the first year, year and a half, we were hosted in many fundraisers every month. Right. So it would be at like a bar or a gym or a restaurant. They, they would let us come in on like a Tuesday night. All I had to do was find some raffle items yeah. and all, you know, friends, family, their regular patrons came in and we would raise, you know, anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars. It took very minimal work on my end sure. and it was great exposure and we did it almost every month. Mm -hmm. So now I felt like we were ready to graduate from that step into the big party yeah. and we have enough supporters and followers and people know who we are in town now. So with some of uh, an event planner and some other people who plan gala support with their help because so i could never do it without their help um we're able to take that next step into like true you know nonprofit status where you have a huge gala yeah yeah what is the state of nonprofits these days in your mind what do you mean what is how do you define nonprofits in 2020 uh i mean i don't know i <laughs> it's it I don't, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I mean, it's just every nonprofit is trying to do the best they can do and improve the community in some way. It's still a business, which is, I think, I think something people don't realize. Like, I have to get paid or I can't do this full time. If I'm not doing it full time, then we can't give as many kids bikes per year. You know, you're not in this business to make money. Right. And if you are, then you shouldn't be in this business, you know, and your nine, you know, your 990 will let the, the public know that very yeah. quickly. So I just make what I need as a teacher, which is, you know, pretty bare minimum. And to make extra money, I have an LLC on the side yeah. where I teach people how to start a nonprofit, sure. do professional speaking. Right. So I can tie the two together, but it's still something separate. But, you know, people, I know a lot of other executive directors in this town, oh, yeah. and a lot of other founders. Right. And, you know, we've all become friends. We all support each other. None of us look at it as a competition. Sure. I mean, if we find a great grant, we tell each other, like, hey, you should apply for this. Or people come to me and they want to provide something and say, you know, that's not really what we do, but, you know, you should really contact so-and-so because that's much more what they do. And so I think, you know, this town has a lot of nonprofits that are all just kind of working together to make the city the best it could be. Let me expand on that. You talked about obviously going places started three years ago. What is the biggest difference between three years ago and right now when you think of your organization? I think um, the type, the amount of you know supporters we have and volunteers, obviously that just grows with time. And just how much you know, I think about. I was kind of like a sheet in the wind in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I was just like grasping anyone that would talk to me or listen yeah. to me. Um, and I've really defined our story, and I've really you know I think we're we're really well branded now. I'm able to have interns, which is a huge help. Sure. You know, we've graduated to that level. Because you have to you have to master everything yourself before you can have an intern or an employee to teach them and be able to pass it off to them. You have to it's like the owner of a company needs to be able to wash the dishes and you know do all the things before they can you know own the restaurant. Yeah. So um, I think just before I was just doing whatever I could do, and now I'm much more organized with I know who to reach out to to help in this area, and I know how to. We reach out to and help in this area instead of just trying to do it all myself. Oh, yeah. You talk about that story. What else would you add to the story right now when you think of the organization? Just, I mean, I think our growth is the story. It's, you know, right now we haven't gone national yet, but that is the goal. And we are, you know, we have about three or four states that we're, we have true potential. Sure. We're like this close, you know, to be like, yes, we're doing it. Um, and so, I think right now our story is, oh, we remember when we were that local, you know, we were just doing it locally. Yeah. Remember when we only did two schools a year? Yeah. Remember when we only had, you know, five board members? We've had the same board members since day one. Wow. This is the first time we added two new people. So now we have, um, counting myself, six of us. Right. And so, you know, remember when it was just the, the four of us, you know, and, you know, that, that kind of thing when it was just small. And now it's 
we're adding that sort of, you know, our yearly gala. I mean, that's a really big deal. And, um, you know, adding another state and being able to expand and spread this joy in other cities who maybe don't know what we're doing. Nationally, which one of those states and cities resembles going places in your mind? Well, any of them. I mean, we could... We, uh, we could be in any single city, any, any single state. Every single city has poverty you know, stricken schools. So there's not one that uh, defines us more than the other. It could be um, somewhere in New York or it could be a small town in the middle of Nebraska. There, there's poverty in all the, every single city. And so um, every one of those kids deserves the joy of a bike and every single one of those kids doesn't have access to it. So there isn't one that's more than the other. Where do you get your confidence from when it comes to those schools nationally? Confidence in what? You say that you, you can get any, you can go to any state and go in places could be successful. Where is your confidence coming in from? Well, because I know that there, there, this is a, this is a unique nonprofit. Mm -hmm. There aren't, there isn't a million of us out there. There are some other wonderful nonprofits sure. that do provide bikes to disadvantaged kids, but. No one that I know of in any research I've done is do, giving to every single child in the whole school and their custom bikes. And that's how we stand out. And it doesn't make us better, it makes us different. Sure, sure. But I, it's not a common nonprofit. And so, you know, the, like I said, this is a common memory that we take for granted. Most people in society have shared this memory of having a bike. And that's not something that only some kids would want. I don't know a single kid who's like, nah, I don't, need that. I don't really want that bike. You know, they want it, and it's more to them than just a toy. It's sure. freedom and escape yeah. from a home life that isn't typically safe or predictable. Yeah. It's something to own a value. It's gonna that's gonna build confidence, and it's restored innocence when oftentimes that's been taken. It's it's a sense of that. You know, when we get on a bike. We feel like a kid again yeah. for a minute. Yeah. Kind of ride around a few big circles sure. and you feel like that kid. Right. So it's allowing a child to actually feel like a child and being able to find businesses that want to support that sure. and have a direct, large impact in their exact neighborhood of where their business is. I don't know many businesses that don't want to have a hand in that. And so they're able to give to a local not you know to a, a, a local cause right where they are by funding the bikes in an area. So if we were to go to that small town, Nebraska, or in you know the inner cities of New York, there's going to be companies in both that want to have a hand in helping those kids in that area. You talk about research. How many poverty stricken schools are located in Charleston County, Yvonne? There's 31 Title One elementary schools in Charleston County School District. And so, you know, we were on to our fifth and sixth school, mm. chipping away at them. Right. But, you know, where the way I see us, I foresee us expanding is it'll be businesses that want to fund all of the bikes for the, for the school near them. And the school doesn't benefit. It's just our means to get to the kids. Sure. But, you know, if there's this, um, a business in Somerville that wants to fund one of the Title I schools out there, like, great, they can... They can do sustained funding where they um, pay partially over two or three years. They can partner with another business who they work well, who they work with often, and sure. split the cost. They're the only sponsors who put their their logos on the bike. But you know, we that's how we'll grow faster instead of just us having to raise the funds. Otherwise, that's going to go really slowly. Mm -hmm. We need more businesses that want to have a larger impact and hand in it. Well, absolutely. You talk about memories of a bicycle. Obviously, I had memories of a bicycle with the trike, with the trike, you know, obviously the, you know, training wheels on and everything. What's one bicycle that describes you? What do you mean? <laughs> a bicycle that describes Katie Blumquist. What's that one favorite bicycle of yours? Like, which one did I have? You can talk about that as well. Um, I mean, I just, my memories of a bike as a child were, I mean, my like whole summer, we had a pool. I grew up in LA, everyone has a pool in their backyard. Yeah, cool. Going from the pool to the bike, just back and forth all summer, my swimsuit, my entire childhood was that. And so I can imagine, you know, with the streamers and the bell and just going as fast as you possibly can with the neighborhood friends. That is just what we did. We went into each other's pools and would hop on our bikes and go to the next person's pool and hang out there and then go back on our bikes. And that was my whole life. Mm. And so, that's just that memory alone. I can't imagine, you know, what would I've done all summer if I didn't have that? And it's that little bit of freedom you can have as a kid to ride at least up and down your street by yourself, if not around the block. And so, I mean, just that 
represent that bike represents my whole childhood. Mm. Okay, let me go to the Ch July 2019 Charleston Living Magazine article, in which they interviewed you about, and they said this: the power of a bike. They said this quote: "What was it about this generous gesture that captured people's heart and their wallets?" Blumquist credits the universal power of a childhood bell bicycle. You said this quote: "It's something people can connect with." Unquote. What is that universal power right now? Well, I don't understand what you're asking. Let me reread that. It says, Blumquist credits the universal power of a childhood bicycle. What is that universal power these days in your mind? I don't really understand. I don't know. I, I don't actually really understand. Oh, no I don't, worries. I don't, I don't, <laughs> saying universal power. I don't know what that is. No I worries. Know. You said this quote, it's something people can connect with. Yes. How can people connect with a bicycle these days? Um, I mean, the same, if it's, we're talking about kids. You know, it's the same thing, okay. not never changing okay. from our great grandparents riding yes. bikes to us. You know, getting on a bike. It's that freedom. You know, it's what a car is for us as adults. Sure. It's yeah. freedom. It's owning something of value. Mm -hmm. You know, for a child, it's it's not only the joy, but it like I said, it could be the freedom and escape. It's all those other things we don't even think about when they may not have a great home life. Um, but it's you know, I think it's. It's that cute, it's just that staple of childhood that doesn't ever change. Change, absolutely. And let me go back to the top of that article because it reads this. Blumquist was a first grade teacher of Capitol Hill Elementary, a Title I school filled with low income students in North Charleston. Being a teacher is no small undertaking, but teachers at a low income school mostly face an extra set of challenges. I know you're a nonprofit founder now, but what are the challenges that keep you up at night as a former teacher? Well, having been a teacher, this is we have three programs actually, not just our bikes. Right. We also give Halloween costumes, which is another childhood joy, and we also partner with local businesses and we provide whatever their product is as a gift of joy for the staff that work at these schools. Because having been a Title One teacher, right. you know you are under you don't become a Title One teacher because education is your number one passion. You become a Title One teacher because you want to be that extra. Per, your passion is that population. You are oftentimes the only consistent person in those children's lives. The only person that actually asks them, what's your favorite movie? How was your weekend? Like actually has a conversation with right. them and gets to know them. Yes. And so, but those kids are bringing their stress from their home life into the classroom, into the hallways, into the cafeteria, their parents in the front office. Right. And there isn't PTA or PTA money to ever do anything for them like the more affluent schools have. Right. And I remember... I mean, you cry almost every single day out of stress, frustration, you know, feeling horrible for some situation in a kid's life. It, it's a million things, but it's a lot of frustration. It's kind of the underlying term of what's expected of you and what you're actually able to do with the behavior and the oversized costume. It's just so, so, so much. And um, there, I remember going to like my mailbox in the front office and there'd be like a Hershey's kiss in there. And I was like, oh, who did this? I needed this. Who did this? And that little one out piece of chocolate shifted my day. Mm -hmm. So I just thought the smallest gesture can shift these people's day. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've seen people literally cry over a cup of coffee we handed them. And they're like, you have no idea how much I needed this. And I just say, I, I do though. That's because I was one of you. And so it's those, it was those things that keep me up at night. It's the ever ending stress, worrying about certain kids, mm -hmm. you know, when they go home and it just, it's, and then, you know, the pressure with the test scores and all oh, yes. of that, it's just, it doesn't, it's, it's extreme. The burnout rate's five years for a Title I teacher. That just kind of tells you how stressful it is. Wow. When you were a Title I teacher and now obviously a nonprofit founder, what's that one kid that resembles you? Well, the little boy that inspired this whole thing was Jawan, and he was in my first grade class. And mm -hmm. so... He's something. He's in fifth grade now, and I still see him. I just took him out um, a couple weeks ago, yeah. into lunch, and he, um, you know, he was. I wouldn't say he resembles me because I mean we're all different, but he was the one that I connected with. Mm. You know, I mean I connected with let lots of kids for different reasons, right. but he was the one that inspired all of this, and I saw this potential in him that wasn't being pulled out, and it was being, you know, wanting to show him there's all these cool things in this world you can do as long as you get through school first. Sure. And so he just always has an upbeat, excited, you know, pers you know, attitude. And, you know, maybe he gets frustrated in school and gets in trouble, but I'm like, gosh, you know, he's still going to be such a great, he's such a great person. 
Yeah. You know, he's charismatic, and that's a, a lot of people don't have that right. attribute. And that's what's going to get you far in life is having charisma and being able to connect with people, make them laugh, and being having like a genuine heart. And so, I love being able to watch him grow and develop. And even though school may be a struggle, mm. he's just got to get through it because he's going to still do great things. Great things. And obviously, you're here to talk now about obviously teachers not getting paid enough, and teachers need more support and resources. As a former Title I teacher, where are you emotionally with that? Oh, I mean, I still feel, I always say we as if I'm still a teacher. <laughs> or I say, you know, oh, my kids, meaning my old class, kids from my class. Right. Um, because I still feel like I will always be a teacher. I'm still such an advocate for the, the teachers and staff. Sure. And that's why we have that program, just yeah. to bring them as much, a little bit of joy as we can. Sure. And I know how much they care about the, their students. And so many of them reached out to me after we gave Halloween costumes or the bikes, telling me little stories, anecdotes about the kids in their class that they connected with and how much that costume or that bike changed their life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm always still, you know, very interested in all the politics that surround the whole, all the teacher issues. Issues. I know you talked earlier about going places that been in existence for three years. How many bicycles have you been able to give out all together? We've given almost 1,600 bikes. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. And we've given, um, we've collected about 2,000 Halloween costumes and we've gone into, um, we've offered them to five schools total. Five schools total. Wow. And how do you hope to beat that, you know, fundraising goal in 2020? Well, we haven't. Um, we have, we're having our annual board meeting in the next couple weeks. We don't. Have, I don't have that number <laughs> for what our goal is. Because we have to come up with that together. Sure, sure. But you know, definitely the goal is to keep adding on to those schools and not just doing two, but doing more than that and being able to hire an additional staff member. So I'm not. I mean, I, I can only do so much. Right. It's not, it, I'm at the point where I'm capped out. Like I can't physically be, do more. And so if we're going to grow. We need more people to help us grow. So that's kind of where the board is going to help. And, um, you know, the Halloween costume program, we were able to, that doesn't cost us any money. It's just a feel good thing. Yeah. Interns can have really been able to help organize that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were only able to go into three schools because that's as many schools as I was physically able to get to mm -hmm. loading, unloading costumes. But the goal would be to have more people, volunteers who are trained in, to be other me's yeah. so we can be in all the schools at once on Halloween with several box trucks going from school to school unloading costumes. So um, the goal this year would be to go to get into six schools sure. instead of three and be able to do, you know, we already, we've already paid for the bikes for May. So yeah. we've got two schools done there. The okay. goal would be to do one more school yeah. in the fall, expand nationally. Next year, do three schools, continue to expand nationally. Nationally. And how do you hope going places will grow in the next five to 10 years? Well, I'd like to implement other forms of joy, for instance, um, access to swim lessons where we would provide a grant to the first grade, um, the first grade at different schools where the kids are taught how to swim because number one, that's safety. We live in Charles at the sure. beach and that is, like I said, from the pool to the bike was my childhood. Swimming is such a fun, a, a fun piece of childhood and even as an adult. And so being able to provide them with that joy would be great. Um, but I continue in the next three, five years. I mean, I hope that we're in several states and we have advisory boards in all those states. And I'm kind of overseeing all of the bike reveals and yeah. as we set them up around the, around the country and then have, you know, a program director here that's doing a lot of the day to day that I'm doing. Um, so that, that would be the goal in the next three to five years. And obviously you went from being a Title I teacher to now a nonprofit founder, literally, I guess, in the past five years or so. When you take off your nonprofit hat and your teacher's hat, who else is Katie Blumquist these days? Well, as I mentioned, they have the LLC, and so I really love professional speaking and public speaking. That's become, I found, I really feel most comfortable and thrive on stage. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll come up on stage and talk. I need a volunteer. I will. And because I'm comfortable with what I'm talking about, sure. and I have a really good story. Sure. Not everyone has made something go truly viral. Right. They may have gotten national attention, but going viral is a whole other yeah. beast. Yeah. And that was a wild experience. Yeah. And people always ask me, how did you do that? Yeah. And I've been able to keep up that momentum. Here we are three years later right. with national media right. still getting its attention. Right. So I have several good talks that I've created that come from my experience um, with doing that. Some motivational things with things I've learned and how I be, I was this, you know, 
nobody teacher who wasn't really good at anything and did something that actually influenced the country to donate and get on board and create a nonprofit. So I, I want to implement my talks to help inspire other people. And then those will lead to different workshops and coaching things. And then I have a seven month online course where I can guide you through step by step take all the guesswork out of starting your own nonprofit. Right. So if people don't have time to figure it out and be that sheet in the wind and just do whatever you can get your hands on. I tell you every month what you need to do, who to, con you know, so it's, you actually can get your nonprofit started and running and successful. So outside of that though, I mean, that's all work related to no my life is work. Yeah. Um, but you know, I like to hang out with friends yeah. and I like to be social and do all the, the regular things, you know, and spend time with my family. Yes. And do all this entire process, obviously you've been featured on Steve Harvey and all these other students and NBC Nightly News and whatnot, and you have all these bikes and you basically help a lot of kids, you know, become happier. What have you learned from this personally? I've learned that it's not about, you know, I've, unfortunately, I lost several friends when all that happened and I, and I was shocked because I'm like, this isn't about me. I mean, yeah, it's cool that I get to experience it, but no one's remembering my name or my face as what I'm doing. Right. And that's the way it should be. You know, it's not about me. And so um, I, I had learned that the insecure person is the person that's, that's going to talk negatively about you or not be your friend anymore. And it's the confident um, people who are, you know, going to be the ones that say, how can I be a part of this? They're the ones that want to share it and support it. And so I, I've learned to stop being, take it as a blessing. Like I don't, who wants people like that in their life? And instead, focus on the people that are the supportive, confident ones that want to be part of it and support it. And so that was the biggest learning thing for me through all this was the shock that even though it's not about me, people tried to make it about me or they made it about themselves. How could you correct that in the next ten years? How could I correct it? Yes, ma'am. For that who? narrative that people think it's all about you. How could you correct that? Um, I don't think you can. I mean, there's some people are always going to think the way they think. Um, and that's that ignorance that, I mean, if there was a solution to that, this world would be a lot better, right? Um, but I just think just continuing to, I mean, I know what I'm doing sure. and I know, and I know who I am. And so as long as my friends and family in the majority of people will agree, um, it's the, it's, there's always going to be the haters, you know, you can't, I love reading, um, whenever there's like a news article, reading all the comments, Shoot. but oh, I yeah. find myself responding to the negative ones and be like, well, no, you're actually incorrect. Actually, we actually do provide <laughs> comments and lots too, or, oh, you know, God. actually, and I, and I'm like, I have, why am I doing this? Yeah. So, you know, just kind of ignoring that. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you can do. Well, Katie Blomquist, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quintin's Close Ups. Thank you. You're welcome.